Hello and welcome to the webinar of the Future of Sustainable Data Alliance uh, that the Future of Sustainable Data Alliance is doing in conjunction with our partner, OMFIF. Um, as chair of the Alliance, I'd like to first wish it a happy birthday. Uh, today is the first anniversary of the Alliance, and it gives us a good opportunity to also remind ourselves of what its purpose is. Uh, this Alliance was formed a year ago in order to answer the crucial question, what data do investors, regulators, and government need for the future to deploy sustainable finance regularly? Uh, it's a tough, big, ambitious question. Uh, and the FOSDA partners, the Future Sustainable Data Alliance partners are working forward in 2021 with some new work streams. Uh, the work streams there include mapping the data to taxonomies. It includes forward-looking data streams, thinking about the talent development and capacity building in sustainable data, and also crucially focusing on mapping data gaps and data holes to highlight the data sets that are needed for today and tomorrow in order to work very closely with the regulatory community, the needs of investors, and the entire financial ecosystem. So with this in mind, uh, today I'm delighted to announce that FOSDA is also launching a data council. So this data council is a group launched today uh, that welcomes Refinitiv, Bloomberg, S&P Global, and Moody's into the members of the council. The data council turbocharged FOSDA's work streams and convened global data experts uh, it's going to be open to all, so please do join us and we welcome new members in order to contribute their views on data. The FOSDA Data Council will provide a much needed industry and regulator sounding board, specifically focused on data for sustainable finance. So we hope to be a strong partner to regulators, a strong partner to all of the excellent work going on globally via different coalitions, both in the public and the private sector. So it's an exciting announcement for us to kick off today. Uh, and we certainly have a very uh, packed agenda for this, uh, for this hour. Um, I'd like to kick off by introducing our first panel. Um, you'll see them here. Uh, Verena Ross, uh, ESMA Executive Director and Co-Lead of the IOSCO STF Workstream focused on CRAs, ESG ratings, and data providers. Welcome, Verena. Uh, Fabio Natalucci, NGS, uh, NGFS co-lead on bridging the data gaps and IMF deputy director of the Monetary and Capital Markets Department. Welcome, Fabio. Michael Sheeran, senior advisor, Bank of England. Welcome, Michael. And finally, Hugh Van Stienis, senior advisor to the CEO, chair of Sustainable Finance Steering Committee at UBS. Um, they all have incredible bios and uh, background. So please do uh, scroll down on your screen and you'll see a bit more about each of them. Um, but what I'd like to do to kick us all off is to put a poll question up for you, the audience. Really like to get your participation. Uh, the question is, what will be the most impactful sustainable finance commitment or regulation or initiative in 2021? Uh, and you've got sort of A through G. We couldn't decide on getting this down to three or four. There's too many things going on in the world. So uh, be liberal and uh, sort of bold about your choices. And we'll pull that up. Uh, later in uh, uh, once this panel concludes. So you've got a bit of time to action that and I understand the technology is working with us. You'll be able to continue to see that as we speak. So please do join in. Uh, so I'd like to turn to our panel, uh, waste no more time and, and get some of their views into, into the marketplace. Um, my first question is, is directed at um, our, our, our regulatory and, and supervisory community. So that's, that's Verena, Fabio and Michael. The question is, what do you see as the top priority for 2021 in ESG data in order to ensure that it can be leveraged as a tool to achieve global climate and sustainability goals? Really kick us off. You know, where do you see the, the priority and what's going to happen this year? Verena, can I start with you? Yes, sure. Thank you very much, Sherry. And uh, thank you very much for asking me to participate in this panel. Talking from the ESMA perspective, our current top priority is really to improve availability, quality, and usability of ESG data. And concretely, for me, that means pushing for greater disclosure by a large number of European financial and non-financial companies, improving the reliability and consistency of these disclosures, and making also disclosures and other ESG-related data easily accessible and machine-readable for example, through the European single access point. 
So these are clearly cross-cutting cross issues, and in a way, they support each other across the whole investment chain. Data provided by one party will um, ultimately help others to fulfill their disclosure requirements and their data requirements. So um, our current areas of concrete work this year to improve ESG disclosure requirements are specifically related to three pieces of legislation, taxonomy regulation, uh, the so-called SFDR, Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, and also the forthcoming changes to the non-financial reporting directive. So those are three pieces of European legislation which will go a long way, I think, altogether to improving availability and comparability of ESG-related information for investors, very importantly, but also for public authorities, supervisors and regulators. And 2021 will be an important transition year in a way, first to finalize the legal backing and uh, texts, but also to be the first year where entities will face the considerable challenge of preparing the first sustainability disclosures under the taxonomy and SFDR regulation. So it's important to raise awareness, and I know you at FOSTA are doing that in a big way, amongst market participants to ensure that the adequate level of data quality is there in order to really support this disclosure obligation. Great. Let me stop here. I've got a few more remarks, but uh, we can come back. Uh, we'll definitely be back to you. Thank you so much, Verena, for that. Uh, Fabio, perhaps I can turn to you. Um, you know, same question, which is what's what's what should we be really taking note of in 2021 for data? I think the, the two priority in two words are like data disclosure in some sense. So there is clearly positive momentum for better quality disclosure from a variety of stakeholders. Uh, they ask for consistent, more granular, comprehensive information, particularly in the climate uh, arena. There are a number of efforts out there to look at taxonomies, for example, framework, but there's also these efforts may have led to some sort of like fragmented landscape. So I think the objective is to avoid fragmentation both from a regulatory standpoint, as well as from a financial market. Right? Those are global capital markets. Um, so uh, having fragmentation in global capital markets will actually hamper sustainable finance. So in some sense, we need clarity in terms of purpose and scope. We need coordination among all these efforts. And we also need a convergence in the end. So it sometimes it's like a building block, right? It's all start with data. Uh, you need robust, high quality data. Uh, that's the starting point. Then you need to, in some sense, speak the same language. So you need some taxonomy uh, in the sense that both data and taxonomy are both uh, related to the issue of disclosure. That's, that's where you start. Then you need a framework. The framework in some sense is like a bookshelf. That's where you put the, you put the information. Uh, clearly, a lot of focus has been on the TCFD. I've been supported by the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, for, for a while now. Uh, the also issue of implementation. Um, when you go down implementation, there's the issue of like, I don't know, voluntary versus mandatory. It's the issue of like single, double, dynamic materiality, and so on. So there's some points in terms of when it gets implemented. And then finally, there's an issue of how relating uh, climate or sustainable finance disclosure to financial disclosure. So how do you get in a point that it actually can be quantified from a financial viable standpoint? But ultimately, I think the objective, again, is to avoid fragmentation and making sure that we have robust, high quality, consistent data, uh, that we have minimal agreed upon taxonomies so that we can speak the same language across the globe. And then the goal down the road, maybe not for this year, but down the road is to reach some sort of like global minimum standard and disclosure. Yeah, so that we can foster financial markets, we can allow investors to price uh, climate related risk, for example, as well as also support regulator and and authorities in terms of assessing financial stability risk arising from, from, from finance. Great, thank you, Fabio. Know, I think we can all appreciate as we've been in lockdown, the idea of building a bookshelf uh, sometimes is quite uh, top of mind these days. So it's, a, it's a good one for us to think about in terms of putting all our knowledge together. Uh, Michael, can I turn to you uh, from your perspective? I know you've been working with this you know, even at the G20 level for, for, for many, many years. Uh, you know, what happens in 2021 we should be thinking about? No, again, it's, it's, as you pointed out, Sherry, to, to everyone else here, the data is the lifeblood. It is the building block for any decent decision making. And we, we spent a lot of time in the G20 and the, and the BOE is also looking at this quite a bit, particularly in light of we're going to be doing an uh, environmental stress testing on the largest institutions in the city of London this year. And we'll talk probably a little bit more about that later. And 
And I think Fabio pointed out very clearly, you obviously need quality data, you need taxonomies, frameworks, and disclosure. But I think to your exact question, the interesting point will be, particularly after we finish our stress test, because you asked what, what's missing or where the gaps are. And as we all know, the financial institutions are the intermediaries, they, they, they are the link into the real economy. So the ability for them to communicate with their clients and be able to extract that quality data that Fabio talked about, that, 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 that good data, because I think of a, you know, we had a little bit of a pre-discussion before this and we talked about you know, a lot of the data isn't precise and or it's missing or they just, you know, they don't have it all together. So I think what, what we're hoping to find out as part of this is obviously we're focused on the resilience of the financial system to climate risk and how to drive net zero. But I think the first piece of this will be when we get the information back and we start looking at the scenarios and everything, we'll get a, a much better idea across sectors, sectors of credit, where are the missing data points? Do certain institutions have a harder time um, tracking accurate um, energy efficiency in their commercial real estate portfolio? Or is it more around, they've got portfolios of automobile leases and loans, do they know how, what percentage of them are diesel, what percentage of them are regular petrol, what, and then be able to start taking a look at that and understand where that affects their credit risk in their portfolio, what are their exposure levels, and how good is that data? And, you know, I, obviously the, 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 Disclosure is absolutely key, but I think what I'm, I'm trying to deliver here is just the getting that first bit of good data, and you're not going to probably get it in the first round, as you know, because banks traditionally haven't kept a lot of this data, so they're now trying to get this. Find what are the most efficient ways to do it? Do they ask their clients to use technology and monitors in real estate, things of that sort? So we're at, I wouldn't say square one. We've been talking about this. I remember the first TCFD meeting in 2015, the workshop. So we've been talking about this for a while, but we're now starting to think about in a real concrete methodology, how do we build from the bottom up? How do we somehow scrub it? Then we disclose it. And then the real tricky part is ultimate, how do the real economy um, actors who we finance, how do they develop models of doing business that actually will lead towards a net zero and how do they execute on that without failure. But anyway, so the real focus is around seeing how that data is across the stream and we'll have a better, and maybe we do a follow-up panel after we finish our stress testing and I, we can tell you where we think, obviously in an anonymous basis, where some of the gaps appeared. Fantastic, Michael. And I think that the, our, you know, the data council uh, being launched today uh, should be a really important partner uh, for all that work going forward and make that an iterative thing. Um, as uh, as that, that moves forward, um, Hugh, um, you know, th as as our our, our link, uh, one step closer to the real economy. Um, it, it question slightly differently for you from an industry perspective. I think the ultimate goal here is to enable capital to be mobilized at scale, uh, and and trying to get that mobilized into that sustainable purpose. I mean, how do we make that happen? And can you call out any specific blockers from your perspective? I mean, we've heard some of the challenges from the rest of the panel already. Uh, well, thanks, Sherry. Well, so, look, I, I, I think you're right that this we really should be framing the question around how we mobilise capital, both in private and public markets. But yeah, you know, and, and obviously, clearly, what comes from finance. Um, look, I think we're all encouraged by some of the progress, um, but let me highlight sort of three areas where I think we could do a little bit um, better, or where there's more focus from policy and the private sector. So, first is obviously getting realising the full potential of TCFD, and I think all of us on the panel are committed to that. Uh, I think what's very interesting with Mark Carney as the private finance ambassador for the UN is will we nudge more countries to make TCFD mandatory? I think the disclosure levels by the largest companies are good, but the combination of net zero policies and TCFD policies, I hope by the end of this year, we've got 90% of large cap companies around the world covered. So that, that's for me important. And as um, Michael said, it's not just TCFD, there's a whole bunch of climate related data which then needs to come under it, real estate registers, for instance. Second is the EU taxonomy, which I think is a really big deal for all of us uh, on the event today. Um, and I think it's, you know, the, the scale of ambition is unbelievable and is really impressive. But as, you know, the great Frenchman Voltaire once said, don't let perfect the enemy of the good. And I think there is a number of practical challenges with the taxonomy to realize its full potential. Um, you know, first, you know, for the EU to issue green bonds at scale, 
it can't currently do it um, for, for a variety of reasons which we can go into, some of which are data related, some of which are the taxonomy of which properties can be included. Um, it's, it's very clear at the moment that ICMA has got a good paper out suggesting some alternative methodologies which actually could op open up that blocker. I think second is then um, what proportion of companies' revenues will actually be um, consistent with the taxonomy. Uh, the work the German government did um, uh, just before Christmas showed that even about 20% of Eurostox 50 companies were somehow aligned, only 2% were precisely aligned. And again, we mustn't let, you know, we, we must let data companies like yourselves and Bloomberg and MCI work with the investment industry to fashion, you know, uh, best efforts data. And I certainly think if we could have a glide path, as we were discussing before, to best, to, to glide path to precision, maybe even over a five year period, uh, I think that'd be very valuable. I realize there's some significant politics in this, but for it to actually work in practice, um, I think it'd be counterproductive if we don't have a best efforts. And thirdly, um, the entire asset, the USITS industry is asked to disclose by January of next year, given the taxonomy has not even been agreed at a high level principles by governments, it is inconceivable that that January deadline is achievable unless there is a best efforts cha change. So I think there's a lot of practical best efforts work which needs to be done and you know, my, my concern with the EU taxonomy originally was it was just far too precise. I actually think what Singapore's put out two weeks ago is something which I find um, investors will find more uh, easy, uh, will be more practical uh, to mobilize capital. And last, but I'll be very brief, is then stress tests. Obviously this is a topic very close to my heart given my work for Governor Carney uh, recommending them in my, in my report and Michael's now doing the hard work of actually implementing them. Uh, but I think this is something where, again, we shouldn't let, uh, we need, I think the um, NGFS and the 18 central banks undertaking exploratory stress tests this year fully understand this is gonna be best efforts. And what I really hope is that in the second half, we can do a, a, a really useful wash up between the public and private sector of where were the data gaps and how we can improve them. Because this is at the end of the day, a transition and a process and we're all committed to you know, in, in improving that. Great. Thank you, Hugh. And, and thanks for bringing up those, those timelines uh, that we do need to keep in mind and, and the fact that this is an iterative process. Um, can I turn to you, Verena? Um, in your IOSCO Sustainable Task Force role and, and as well at the EU level through ESMA, have you, you've got a great overview of what the opportunities and challenges facing issuers and investors community are. You know, what, do you, what would you call out as the positive uh, developments? What would you say sort of are uh, some of the best ESG data space uh, developments that, that you can see sort of perhaps driving towards standardization? So indeed, I, I'm trying to, you know, also marry up the kind of huge push that we are seeing in Europe with also the general global belief, and you see that represented in IOSCO, that the agenda of sustainability is just really important and that we need global solutions in all of this. One key expectation is that the development of an international set of reporting standards should be created um, for sustainability reporting by corporates and financial institutions. And I think that is the ultimate aim that we are all driving towards. Going back to my earlier reference on the sustainable investment chain, reporting by companies, therefore, in a way, is the first building block that we need. And for that, clearly, having data, but also having the companies able to properly use and report on that data is key. And that has to be a common undertaking. And therefore, both from a European and also global perspective, I very strongly support the ongoing efforts to further standardization in this area which will also allow us to improve um, ultimately the kind of digitalization aspect around it as well, because um, data will have to be machine readable, will have to be usable by a whole range of different issues. And uh, here clearly at the moment, sustainability data is still behind, ESG data is behind the traditional financial disclosures where there's already a high level of global standardization through the IFRS and so on. So, but data standardization should also foster some degree of convergence in methodologies to produce ESG related information, as others have said. In this context, I'm co chairing the specific work stream on ESG ratings and data providers, as you rightly said, who are clearly an enabler also, particularly for smaller companies, 
to be able to report because they might not be able to build their own models and their own systems. And that's, I think, where uh, there's a connectivity here and ultimately enabling us also to work out where are the limitations, where are the gaps, as others on the panel have already said. So for me, the greater consistency standardization that will facilitate the process of large amount of ESG data and usage by the investment community, as well as the supervisors for monitoring purposes will be key. Great, uh, a, a, huge, a huge amount of work being done there and, and sort of calling out ratings uh, as specifically uh, reliant on some of these data sets, but uniquely placed within the ecosystem is, is important to get right. Um, maybe I can pivot over to you, uh, Fabio. Um, as the co-lead of the NGFS work stream that's bridging the data gaps and looking at sort of data specifically, can you tell us a bit about sort of your process that you're working through? Um, and what steps are you, are, are you doing to make you know, the work stream move forward? You've got a huge number of participants in terms of countries that are, are, are listening to the outcomes of this. So it'll be quite seminal work. Can you share with us the journey? Yeah, so the, 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 the NGFS uh, Bridging the Data Gap work stream was launched in uh, mid of last year in a century to implement one of the recommendations of the first comprehensive NGF, NGFS report of 2015, essentially setting up a joint group to look into the data gap issue. Um, we start in July. The objective is to create a, a report, a final report by the end of this year. Uh, looking at metrics and data needed by the authorities, financial institution, investor to enhance the assessment essential for climate related risk and opportunities. Uh, we, we set it up in three steps. So step one is to identify the relevant data needs from a user perspective. Um, so looking at supervisor from the uh, market perspective as well. The phase two is to focus on taking stock of what's available. So what we need, what's available, and then step three will be come up with policy recommendation how to bridge this data gap between needs and availability. Um, we have structure, we have about 50 people. We have structured three teams. One team we call a team market that looks at data needed by different market participants, whether those are asset manager, buy side entities, investor, to make sustainable investment decisions as well as to manage risk. There's a micro group that looks more from the needs of financial institutions as well as regulator who apply metrics, for example, or approaches to measure climate related risk and the climate impact of portfolios. And that is a team macro that looks at higher level aggregation for so either countries or sector, for example, to monitor green finance. Uh, process wise, we have, of course, started in house and look what was already done within the NGFS. There are other work streams uh, in, the, in the NGFS. And then we start, the first step was to look out of various stakeholders in the international forum. So the FSB, uh, the OECD, uh, SASB, TCFD, PRI, and the long alphabet list of, of stakeholders. And then we decided we're gonna reach out to uh, market participants, looking, talking to both banks, as well as buy side, organizing a couple of workshops there. And also continuing the outreach toward the corporates. So that would be one way to learn more about TCFD. Now that can be improved. Also talking to data providers, rating agencies. Um, and again, the, the objective is to reach the, the end of the year and come up with a comprehensive report on this data gap. And to conclude, I mean, the way we look at disclosure, we look at disclosure as a way to essentially cap this, uh, to bridge this data gap, right? So you start with the need, this is where the gaps are. Now do you close the gap? One way to do is to disclosure. Uh, and so we're going to take the angle of the disclosure, particularly from the from the data side. How can we help improve availability of data? Great. Well, it sounds like um, you know we 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 hopefully will continue to work really closely together. And with the data council, you know we're looking forward to using uh, that you know that brain trust to also so help inform the the process and the journey and and make again that iterative process um, beneficial to everyone. So. Uh, you know, huge amount of work. Thank you for doing it. Uh, if I could pivot to you, Michael, uh, we've been talking a lot about stress testing. Uh, we've been talking a lot about sort of how it is the central banks uh, play that role. You've already mentioned that earlier. Um, I guess the, you know, the question to you is in implementation uh, from your perspective, you know, where do you already see where there's going to be problems? Uh, and how is it that um, sort of the wider community can be very uh, specific about helping yeah. Uh, central banks implement and achieve those goals? Well, I think there's, there's two sets of data as well. There's both the, the, the quantitative data that, that, that they can already look at in terms of 
looking at who the real economy clients are in the institutions and actually getting that. It's around whether the, the carbon footprints and things of that sort. But there's also some real qualitative data. So some of the variables we'll be looking at in this, um, in this stress test will be obviously the physical. So it's physical risk around rains and flooding and, and things of that sort. So that, and you, you, as you probably well know, some of the insurance companies, because we're not just looking at the big banks, we're also looking at the big insurance companies as well, both the um, general as well as the life insurance. The life insurance have exposures on stocks and bond investments, and obviously the GIs are the insurers of this. So you have to take some qualitative um, views on both the frequency and the increased intensity around the physical things. So that's qualitative. You've got modeling on that, but are the curves on the models correct? And if you look at pre when climate change was really playing a big role, some of the models, the, the, the curves on those weren't as, as extreme as they seem to be doing now. So some qualitative future looking on potential data. Carbon pricing. We don't have carbon pricing yet, but it's the key element if you're starting to work through um, ultimately how you build a sustainable business model. So if you've got countries in, 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 in um, regions such as the EU, the UK, China that have said net zero carbon, well then you need to figure out what that means to your business model. So again, that's forward looking data that has to be extrapolated on there. And then rules and policies, so things around the EU taxonomy, so things we've talked about. So there's two sets of data and they all have gaps and issues where, you know, do how can you extract them? How can you get them um, properly assessed? So I think, um, Again, we, we, we've tried through the Bank of England from, our, from the very beginning um, with our early work, um, trying to, to set a path forward. And I think the, the, the instructions and note we gave out to the community, to the, um, our firms in 2019 about climate risk, how to look at it was very instructive and helpful. And this is the next big step in that. And then I guess one other thing that will be important for further stress tests as both the data gets better, but also is um, you probably know that in 2023 in the UK, so all of our firms will be obligated to comply in a mandatory way to TCFD and that gets completely buttoned down in 2025. So as you start, again, we, as you talked about and we talked about earlier, a glide path towards how do you get the data extracted, how do you get going? And so you can see that happening. And so there's been a really logical path forward, but it's absolutely crucial for us to have resilient financial markets. And also a second piece of this again is for us to be supportive of the transition to net zero. So those are some of the key elements around data in the stress testing, both now and looking into the future. Fantastic, thanks for, uh, for outlining that. Um, you brought up carbon pricing. A quick reminder to everyone, I'm going to turn to Hugh for a final question, but before that, everyone can uh, can vote in on the uh, polling question. I think carbon pricing may feature on one of those uh, possibilities there. Um, so Hugh, uh, we've been talking about a lot of different things. I know you are you're keenly looking at taxonomies. You're a global bank. Taxonomies are going uh, global. Uh, taxomania uh, may be sort of the phrase uh, to use. You know, how is it that you see that as being either a problem or a, uh, a, a positive uh, in terms of sort of how you're dealing with it as a, as a commercial bank and, and thinking about how it is that you can embrace these? Um, well, look, Shay, let me give you an answer. Obviously, you know, given we've got over a trillion asset management and three trillion wealth management, I'm going to give you a view about markets rather than just banks. And so, look, I think all of us uh, on the call, and there's, um, we all, there are many things we all agree on. We need high quality comparable data to help markets make better decisions about risks and opportunities. Now, the really good news is whether it's the early work that Michael and others did on TCFD uh, and, and the great work some of the data companies have done, there is a, already some, a, a mosaic that you can start to form. And let's be honest, money is in motion. The double whammy of the tragedy of the pandemic alongside climate transition being a much more important topic means that clean energy stocks are up 140% in the last 12 months. Oil and gas stocks, even with the recent reflation trade, are down 24% over the last 12 months. So there is money in motion and people are, are hungry for data to make better decisions. Two, to give you a, a short answer, the challenge I think in markets of finding is we've got a, a three-way Venn diagram. There's people with experience about investing in markets, there's folk who've got policy experience, because obviously there's a lot of policy changes. We've hardly even mentioned Biden on the call today. You know, and then three, there's climate science. The Venn diagram overlap of those three is almost a null set. There are very, very few individuals, at least, 
So what each firm and investment house is trying to do is try to form teams to actually be able to fill out that Venn diagram. And therefore, you know, what are money managers or banks using? Well, uh, I think uh, the, the uh, scenarios were in which the NGFS put together, which um, Fabio and Michael know a lot about, I think were a very good starting point for the banks. But, you know, they're just three specific scenarios. We can agree, disagree, and, and so forth about them. Um, I think the other thing is, in a very complex world, we obviously want to find simplifying solutions which are doable in the time available. So, for instance, if I'm asked, uh, you know, what's the single best way to try and understand the carbon emissions of a company? I'd say go and look at the CDP rating, you know, because they've done the hard work for you. We, again, we can agree, just like a Moody's or S&P rating, we can agree or disagree about the quality of the rating. But as a starting point for debate, I'd always go to CDP. And so I think what you're finding is building blocks coming through. And obviously, there's some very helpful building blocks from Refinitiv, Bloomberg, MSCI and others as well. So um, I think the good news is there's an awful lot in motion um, and, you know, the mosaic is being filled out. Obviously, the more we can, the more precise we can get the mosaic, the better decisions we'll make. But honestly, we're never going to have everything and markets never have everything. We have to make all we need to do. And this goes back to my challenge to the EU is we need to improve the odds of making high quality and better decisions. And therefore, let's not make the perfect the enemy of the good. Great, thank you so much. And, and actually, interestingly, uh, we did a poll uh, of global investors and 88% said that one of their biggest challenges was finding talent in order to be able to deal with the data uh, that's coming out for ESG and sustainability specifically. So definitely work to do in one of our work streams at, at FOSDA going forward. Uh, right, so now is the point where uh, we get to see the uh, poll results. Um, I, I say with much trepidation and they appear fantastic. Uh, so it looks like uh, the audience thinks that uh, carbon pricing initiatives uh, by, uh, uh, by a, su a substantial margin are going to be the most impactful sustainable finance commitment in 2021. Uh, I'm going to conclude our panel by doing a quick rapid fire and calling out each of your names to say, do you agree? And if you don't, which would you choose uh, on this? Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll start in reverse order. Hugh, what do you think? Uh, I think it would be the most impactful, but I don't think we're going to get a global or international one. Therefore, uh, to be honest, in the year of COP26, getting every major company to issue commit to TCFD and a science-based target would be for me the key one. Great. Uh, Michael, what about you? Is our audience uh, right? Okay. I, 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 again, this is me personally, not the Bank of England, but I do agree that the carbon pricing is most important. And for the large um, countries that have committed to legislate uh, net zero carbon, um, in, 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 as uh, Hugh pointed out, Biden hasn't been mentioned, but the US is talking it. EU has UK, China, South Korea, and Japan. So I think even if they were made the first step on it, even, to, even this year and moving it forward, I think it's the most impactful and the sooner we move on it, the better. Thanks, Michael. Fabio, what about you? I actually agree with you. I think the TCFD uh, adoption and then start filling out that bookshelf with actual data, consistent, robust data, I think that's, uh, that would be my first priority. Great, thanks. And Verena? Yeah, so I think you need a combination of the political will and the clear principles and bookshelf, as Fabio called it, with some very concrete measures that actually achieve real progress. And I think their carbon pricing clearly plays a very important role. But I also think you need the C uh, TCFD, you need the COP26 commitment uh, to actually make the technical things come together. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and what a great way to conclude the panel. Appreciate all of your time. I'm sure the audience learned uh, uh, something I certainly did. Um, a big, big thank you for, from us and looking forward to being your partners uh, working forward with FOSDA and with the Data Council. Um, I'd like to hand over to uh, Danai uh, from OMFIF, who is going to lead our next panel, uh, an important partner for us. So again, you know, opportunity to thank OMFIF for your support today. Thank you, Sherry, and what a fascinating panel we've just heard from. Uh, thinking back to just over a year ago when we launched the Future of Sustainable Data Alliance in Davos, the world was a very different place. And I think Hugh was very right in pointing out to the pandemic and the 
uh, uh, importance of climate policy as the double whammy of where we are now. And a lot of improvements have already made, but we still have a long way to go. So it's great to have a, a panel of experts today from our partners from the Future Sustainable Data Alliance to take us through their views and their activities on where we are and what the next priorities are. So we have with us today Sean Kidney, co-founder and CEO of the Climate Bonds Initiative and also a member of the EU Platform on Sustainable Finance, uh, Patricia Torres, uh, Global Head of Sustainable Finance Solutions at Bloomberg, and Simon Zadek, Chair of Finance for Biodiversity Initiative and also um, co-chair of the Technical Expert Group of the Task Force Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, TNFD. So let me start with you, uh, Simon. We've spoken a lot in the first panel about TCFD, uh, but biodiversity and nature-related uh, risks are also rising up in the agendas of policymakers. I think we're now at the stage where we've made clear the why, why they're important. So a lot of members of our community at OMFIF, the regulators, central banks, are increasingly paying attention to this. The Dutch Central Bank did a study on how its a loss of uh, biodiversity is affecting the Dutch financial sector. We at OMFIF devoted the Sustainable Policy Institute Journal in December on this and had a lot of views, including from Sherry on the role of data on this. So I think we, we understand that, that we need to act on this. The why is clear in most people's mind, but what about the what? Um, how is the TNFD different in to the TCFD? What are regulators doing? The world is a very different place now in 2021 to where we were where the TCFD was launched. We have better understanding of, of a lot of things. There are a lot more initiatives, a lot more uh, capital in motion. So what do you think are the key differences and how does this determine what regulators are taking in terms of action? Thanks, Danai, and thanks to you and also to Refinitiv and the Alliance members. So inevitably, a bunch of folks will roll their eyes at this point and go, Jesus, you know, as if carbon and climate wasn't enough. Now we've got a whole bunch of other stuff. So I'm going to set that aside, uh, Danae, because you uh, rightly said, you know, that's not really the question uh, at hand. So, so let me highlight a few of the differences that are beginning to feed through uh, what is effectively the sort of pre-TNFD uh, period uh, that currently involves about 75 financial institutions working uh, together and with a bunch of experts in trying to figure what is it that a TNFD would do and to your point, what would be different? So firstly, to state the obvious, there is no equivalent of a carbon ton. <clears throat> and so if one takes climate, in that narrow sense of carbon emissions reduction, you know, there isn't really an equivalent normative north uh, that one can pick out. It's a more diversified, complex uh, set of factors, perhaps a little closer in some ways to the uh, adaptation agenda uh, than the sort of straight mitigation agenda. So that would be a sort of first piece on the content side. Linked to that, of course, is that, you know, more or less we see climate change as a problem uh, that we need to mitigate, whereas nature productivity, you know, is part of what drives economies. You know, Das Gupta in the launch of the review last week made the observation, I quote him, sort of more or less, um, nature is a primary driver of productivity of many countries around the world. And if you read the text, actually, the point that he makes is that that number is going to get bigger and bigger. So we need to make sure we're understanding this very much as a two-tailed play. Uh, with nature productivity having no real equivalent in the climate space, if you like. Uh, the third piece, and this really comes to TNFD itself, is that I think if you set up TCFD today, you would not only look at material financial risk, and TNFD is not only looking at material financial risk. So the current embrace, and all of this is still a work in progress, uh, is a broader view of nature-related risk that it includes what we would classically understand as material financial risk, but also dependency on nature and impact on nature. Now, how can we understand that? Obviously, um, for Europeans, the double materiality story sort of rings across that way of thinking, uh, and I think reflects in many ways why that broader view of risk is being embraced. But I think we can also tease it out a little bit further in ways that are helpful through a regulator lens. Looking at impact is not not looking at risk. It's simply not looking at risks that have crystallized as material financial risks today. 
which as we know is a fairly constrained short-term view of risk. So looking at risks, material risks, dependencies and impacts allows one really to begin to think about systemic effects over longer periods of time than one would normally take into account in classical relatively narrow views of financial risk. So I think that double materiality story uh, is embedded in the way TNFD is going to move forward. Uh, and I think it connects across to a number of other agendas. Just to add perhaps two or three brief other pieces that sort of flow from that core decision. Firstly, um, if one's looking at impact and uh, one is sitting within a nature space rather than a broader climate space, uh, then actually a whole lot of legal issues are going to become very relevant in figuring out how companies can report against those impacts. Uh, it's one thing reporting on how one's carbon emissions are doing where there is no, if you like, legal framework necessarily governing that, although there may be commitments, uh, but it's another thing talking about the impact on nature, you know, which will cut across many existing environmental regulatory frameworks. So I think the legal aspects of this are going to be uh, as if not far more important than many of the discussions and activities that are going on in the climate related disclosure space. Uh, in addition, although without doubt, like the TCFD, this is intended principally as a sort of by the market for the market. The moment we begin to think about impact, one can also think about public finance. And although within the context of the core TNFD, if you like technical scope, the focus is clearly on the financial sector. So private financial flows. Um, it's clear in discussions with many different actors that we can learn a lot from the public sector as it thinks about nature impacts as well as if you like, on the side, thinking about how this work may be relevant to um, sovereign uh, spend and also DFI spend going forward. So beyond traditional material financial risk aspects. And then my last two pieces, one is, you know, the, the way in which NGFS emerged, you know, depending on how you read history, um, you know, is partly as a result of TCFD being restricted in not being able to take on some of those broader systemic uh, aspects of the work. And that was a sort of decision made, as we all know, um, at the G20 Turkey meeting, the key meeting uh, that led to the formation of TCFD. Now, TNFD doesn't have that restriction. And so I think much earlier on, there will be strong interaction between what's relevant for the investment community and how this feeds through into broader systemic analysis and already as part of the work going on around TNFD, we have central banks directly involved, notably DNB. And clearly we are more and more sort of looking over the fence and trying to balance and uh, equalize, if you like, the work that's beginning to emerge in NGFS and the work that's around biodiversity and the work that is beginning to emerge uh, around TNFD. Final point, the infamous climate nature nexus uh, it's clear to all that we need to align institutionally wherever possible to the approaches that TCFD has taken. So for example, the four pillar approach on strategy, governance, risk management and disclosure. Um, but it's also clear clearly that there are multiple ways out there in the real world that nature and climate interact. And so um, TNFD at this point is conceiving of somewhat of a staged process of building disclosure capabilities um, that increasingly integrate our understanding of nature and climate related aspects of risk. Um, I'm hoping in discussion, we can come back to the question of data, which we haven't really touched on, clearly the central theme of this topic, but I think those would be some of the critical differences I would highlight. Great, thanks, Simon. And I do want to come back to the question on data because there's a lot of differences with climate data. You highlighted some of these. We don't have the equivalent of kind of a carbon footprint that, that we can measure in the same way. Also, a lot of the nature-related data are more public data compared to the private data that we have for climate. So we'll come back to that at the end. But let me turn that turn to, to Sean now with your uh, EU taxonomy hat on, and you've been very involved in that. We've heard about, about this 
in the first panel, and Hugh mentioned, let's not make the perfect the enemy of the good. The EU needs to issue green bonds at scale. There is a lot of um, unbelievable scale of ambition. It's very impressive what has been uh, achieved so far, but we still um, have a way to go. And how do you see the, the, what are your thoughts on data availability, limitations in, re in relation to the EU taxonomy and uh, its upcoming implementation at the start of next year? Well, first, let me say, Hugh is right. We don't want to let the enemy be the perfect of the good. What we are in the process of doing is creating HTML. It's like Tim Berners-Lee's did all those years ago, which led to the creation of the web, a common language that we can all use, that we can code our information in, in such a way as we can compare. We want to, through this process, make it easy for everyone to figure out whether their investments are in fact sustainable or not. At the moment, it's up to consultants. You've got to hire KPMG at some vast price to do your bespoke report. Now that works for the investors. They, do, they can do the due diligence or at least the bigger investors can. But you, me and my mum and pop, it's really hard for them to do the due diligence. They need someone to work on the process of figuring out what is a common language? And we're doing something more that's incredibly important. We are understanding in China, in Europe, and some other countries, the fiscally efficient opportunities we have to mobilize capital in the right direction without necessarily paying for it all as taxpayers. Incentives, a little bit of a guarantee, a little bit of a regulation, a little bit of a central government tweaking of the, or I should say central bank tweaking of the rules. These are things that we're now doing. And we've seen already measures introduced as you at OMFI have done, I know, all too well in China, in Hungary, and we have green QE talking, etc. To do those, we've got to have a rule set. Otherwise, we will get scams galore. And so this idea of a common rule set that's part of the regulatory apparatus is this idea whose time has come. But fundamentally, we're making it easy for everyone. And that's what we're doing in the taxonomy. There's something else we're doing, by the way, which is quite important, which is a win we've had so far, which is we're making the taxonomy science-based. You know, for the last 30 years in discussions of climate change, we've talked about, well, that's what the scientists say we've got to do, but that looks really hard. What about we just do this? That looks good, hey? And that's the National Climate Change Plan or an NDC. Folks, not good enough. That's what's got us to the problem we have now, where we have failed so miserably, utterly, for the last 30 years to get emissions down, let alone to address biodiversity and other extraordinary challenges facing us. Because we have not listened to the scientists. We've said, well, this is all we can do now. In the taxonomy, we're saying, look, you may, might still decide to build a gas plant in Poland, but you have to understand that this is what the science says is consistent with addressing our environmental objectives, then make a call. And if you choose to do what the science says you should not do, be sure you understand the consequences of that. So this is a discussion we have not had properly before the taxonomy has come along. And now we're having it. And we're having it in a way where we'll provide a resource that everyone can use as clear guidance well, what to do? You won't need to hire KPMG as an expensive consultant. Hey, they do great work, by the way, but you know what I mean. You'll be able to just simply look up on the database. I'm a, I'm a triple glaze windows manufacturer in Frankfurt. Do I qualify? And the answer, by the way, is yes, you do. You are seen as sustainable for a whole bunch of reasons I don't need to explain. But the point is, you can look it up. You won't need to do a justification for who you are. You just need to know that you qualify. And that'll apply to investor portfolios and so on. So, hey, it is a grand undertaking. It's an incredibly important undertaking. It's an overdue undertaking. Great. Thanks, uh, Sean. And let me turn to you now, Patricia, as a data provider, as a partner of the Future Sustainable Data Alliance. You've, we've heard from Simon about integrating climate and nature-related risks. We've heard from Sean about mapping data to taxonomies. 
how do you see the future of those challenges going forward? And also um, some of the risks that are coming up, such as the risk of greenwashing. We have a question from the audience that, that have started to coming in and please to all of our listeners start sending in your questions. But there was a lot of um, uh, ESG activity in the past year and a lot of ESG funds and sustainable investments saw so a big growth, but how much of that is greenwashing? What is the role of data in, in tracking that? Thank you, Dana. Uh, extremely good questions. Um, I feel that impact and progress can only happen when business, finance, and government work together. And this is a great example of the forum of the people that we need to actually drive that progress. So data providers are part of finance and our expertise is on data, data collection, curation, and normalization. We want to make sure the investment professionals have access to robust, high quality, consistent, comparable data that is organized, uh, that is credible, accessible, and transparent back to the official document. So I think that we heard a lot of the speakers today saying about that, that we need to have that data quality first, that disclosure. When we have that disclosure, we'll be able to empower investors to incorporate ESG factor into their analyses and help them prevent, prevent false claims on the environmental nature of their investment product, exactly what I said about greenwashing. So we need to support um, our investors to make sure that they are complying with the different regulations. Um, we heard about European taxonomy, like we've also heard about TCFD as well, like as, as a framework that it has more than 110 organizations around the world like supporting them. So I think ultimately our duty as data providers is, is to honor the data that the companies are disclosing, is to honor the industry benchmarks that are being written they are giving us guidance on where we need to be um, to actually reach the carbon neutrality by 2050, share best practices and continue to drive for further disclosure. Just to give you an example today, 40% uh, of the companies in the S&P did not disclose scope one data for the fiscal year 2019, and only 26% have linked executive compensation to ESG. And for Nikkei uh, in Japan, the numbers are 68% for, for the companies and 2% um, of, of the companies are only have the that executive compensation linked to ESG. So I just feel that only when these numbers change can we truly, truly you know, drive progress and we're only able to price assets correctly, mitigating the risk and driving capital domestically and international to foster innovation and growth in a low carbon and sustainable world allowing for you know, growth, jobs, and social equality. So like, I think our job is to actually bring that data curation, bring that disclosure and drive that transparency that, that is so badly needed in, in this market. Great, thanks, Patricia. And, and now in the second bit of the panel, I'd like to, to think a bit to the rest of 2021. We have a lot, um, milestone with COP26, there's high expectations of what we can achieve this year. From your perspective, Simon, we talked a little bit on what the, the data requirements are to advance the objectives of the TNFD. Do you think the current data landscape is fit for, for purpose uh, for nature-related risks? And what would be the, the one main thing that you'd like us to make progress this year? And do you expect that to happen? You're on mute, Simon. Indeed. If it was fit for progress, we could all go to the beach, I guess, um, uh, or at least some version thereof. So I, I'm forced to say no, uh, and then sort of to add in one or two comments. So firstly, I think pushing forward TNFD this year is going to make a lot of difference um, in that it's beginning to draw in and really raise interest amongst the financial community and many of the service organizations, such as Refinitiv and others, uh, in kind of how to manage new data configurations and flows. So that's the first piece of the story. So I think kind of seeing where that's going, engaging in it, not assuming that TCFD, if you like, is the only game in town, but the connection between climate and nature will be important is going to be key. I think the second part of the story is clearly that, you know, the, the, the big challenge in the nature data space um, is spatial data and contextual data. Um, you know that it's not that you know it's not that interesting in some ways apart from knowing that there's a carbon ton. Um, but if you want to talk about water, um, or if you want to talk about forests, then it's only relevant if it's in a place and where contextual data is sophisticated enough 
to understand the nature of the risks and impacts. So we have a huge data flow challenge um, in trying to figure that out. And clearly what TNFD is trying to do, and it reflects some of the comments that were made earlier, is to create a sort of staggered pathway. Clearly there needs to be a low entry point, particularly uh, where there is weak data. And then there needs to be some kind of ratcheting mechanism to move both reporters uh, and users kind of up the line. Uh, and then the third piece of the story is really the link between public data and private data, a point I know that you've already made. Unlike the climate space, the bulk at the moment of nature-related data is actually coming from public sources. Um, but as many of the you know, larger and smaller data providers to the investment community, community know, a lot of that data is at the moment really hard, if not impossible to use too noisy, too confused, what does it really mean and so on. And so as Sherry knows, because we've had this conversation many times, I think there's a real discussion that is emerging around data architecture and whether there is a sort of valley of death problem between large amounts of science-based data and the kind of data flows that commercial providers of data to the investment community need. And the UK is looking at a variety of open source and collaborative platforms uh, a number of financial institutions are trying to figure what collaborative mechanisms one might build to have uh, a greater instance of shared data, given the costs of cleaning the science data. Uh, and indeed, we at FAB are looking at the same thing. So this question of upstream data architecture is really critical. Thanks, Simon. And perhaps we'll have the, the second year anniversary of the Future of Sustainable Data Alliance next year, and a lot of these issues will have been solved. Let's try to get to that point. Um, Sean, on to you. What is the one key thing that you're looking at in 2021 that you'd like us to have solved by the time we have this discussion next year when it comes to the EU taxonomy? Look, we're starting the process. This is a dynamic process. We've got a rule set coming in. We now need a glide path to full adoption. This is where I agree with you. It's going to be difficult in some areas because the data isn't available. But what that doesn't mean we don't need to still set the requirements. To take adaptation, for example, you know, we have lost, we have failed, we have lost the first half of the fight against climate change. We are now experienced climate impacts in more ways than we can count. And you might argue that the pandemic was a climate impact because the collapse of biodiversity led to pathogens jumping between species, et cetera, et cetera. So because we're experiencing this, we need to look at adaptation and resilience measures, which is more than physical. It's also social and economic and system adaptation. So we need to start drawing lines about what we require from future investments to be called sustainable. Some of that data isn't available yet. It's gonna take a while to get there. So let's have a glide path towards getting there while still starting to set the rules about where we want to do. This is of course going to be uh, Verena's job at ESMA in Europe to be able to manage this particular process. We're not going to get it right straight away, but that doesn't mean that we don't want to decide, for example, on minimal thresholds. You know, there have been calls for shades of green. I'm going to say that's all very well, but you need a minimum. For example, introducing more efficient petrol cars is better than standard petrol cars, right? Actually, you're wrong because what you're doing is investing in something that blocks investments in the more ambitious change that we need to achieve, which is electric vehicles or hydrogen, zero carbon vehicles. So now yeah. hybrid vehicles yeah. will not so, qualify. And so this is the minimum we need to do. And data and this is, is going targets to be required. And having the, um, the more information. Thank you. And to you, Patricia, you mentioned that uh, only 40%, that 40 percent of companies in S&P did not disclose scope one data, but only 26 percent have linked executive compensation to ESG, uh, and that for Nikkei it's uh, as low 32. as 2 percent. Where do you want that number to be next year, and how do we get there? I would love to reach to very close to 100 percent. Like the big companies, they need to disclose this data. Scope one data is critical. If we are truly, truly trying to get to, ne to carbon neutrality, we need to make sure that people know and they are able to measure where they are today because you can only manage if you are measuring. So for me, my biggest wish is to make sure that we have one common set of standards for ESG in the same way that we have IFRS 
And the second thing is making sure that ESG gets integrated in the annual reports. The data is available at the same time. At the moment, we have companies that are taking more than nine months to disclose their ESG data. That cannot be acceptable like in the future. So let's get integrated ESG report in the annual report and let's make this data machine readable. That's the only way that the data is going to be accurate. So that's my biggest wish. I really hope that we'll get there next year. Great, thank you, Patricia, and thank you to all of you. Great points today, and I'm sure we can focus on this conversation more in the coming months. Back to Sherry to wrap, up, wrap it all up. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Jenna. Thank you so much to all our speakers. Uh, it's been an absolutely fascinating hour, a lot packed into 60 minutes. Uh, I think that you know all that's left for me to do is to thank all of our panelists, all of our speakers, all of our partners and supporters from across the FOSDA network. Uh, and leave you with a, a hope that you'll continue to join us. We have a very ambitious program for 2021 and further, uh, and please do get involved. Uh, please do join uh, where you can. Uh, your support, your insights are absolutely critical, uh, and working with regulatory and government communities is an absolute foremost in our mind. Uh, so see us as a partner as we move forward. Thank you again, and hope you have a good rest of your days. Thank you.